This is Matthew of Another World Terraria, where I teach and inspire you on the topics of rare plants and artistic nature displays. In this video, we'll continue the tour of my entire plant collection. This is part two of a series of videos that will give you behind the scenes access to my entire collection of terrarium plants. I'd recommend that you watch this series in order, starting with part one, in which I share some important notes about the tour and what to expect. Let's go ahead and get started. Start off with a bin from Ecuador. This filmy fern is stunning because it has veins that are very dark, which contrast against the light green, semi-translucent foliage, as well as having ciliate margins, which means that all of the pinna have little hairs along them. It's very small and hard to see, but it's an absolutely stunning filmy fern. Over on the side here, we have some volunteer begonia seedlings. This is most likely begonia semi-ovata. Volunteer is the term in the hobby for something that pops up from seed or spore or something like that that comes in with other things that you acquired. And by the way, in part one of the tour, one of the very first plants that I showed was Begonia semi-ovata, and that was a more mature specimen that was blooming, so check that out if you'd like to see what the mature plant would look like. There's a variety of bryophytes in this bin as well, including some different mosses, some liverworts such as Ricardia, as well as some leafy liverworts from the family Plagiochylacea. More Ecuador plants, this one right here is in the family Urticacea. It resembled, when it was younger, a pilea, and now that it's maturing, I'm starting to think that it might be more closely related to some kind of nettle. I've definitely been avoiding touching it because it has some various trichomes and things on it that look like it could be stinging. Over here in the corner is a little Peperomia species from Ecuador that has some veins and kind of a dark green with light green and a little bit of maroon as well. It's a pretty common species that's just kind of in a variety of bins that I have and I think I showed it in part one as well. Right down here in the corner is one of my favorite plants. This is a begonia from the section of begonias called gobinias. And this one is similar to Begonia trapeolifolia, but it's a little bit different in foliage shape as well as color and size. Overall, it's a much smaller plant than that species. It's possible that this is a subspecies or some other form of Begonia trapeolifolia. I'm calling this one Begonia af trapeolifolia miniform. The term that I used called AF, it's spelled A-F-F, -F, which is short for species affinis, which means that it has an affinity to or resemblance to another species of plant. In any case, this begonia has nice green leaves with white polka dots on them with the little trichome hairs sticking out of each polka dot. has really nice dentate, rounded, serrated margins of the leaf and it climbs in a vining fashion. Bin number three of Ecuador plants have a filmy fern right along the side here and in some other areas in the bin with bright green semi-transparent foliage and nice shaped pinna that kind of overlap. This bin is grown over by a larger plant. This is Begonia polyloensis. This one would be better for a very large bin or a large vivarium or perhaps a greenhouse. It can stay somewhat compact and you can trim it back in a bin like this, but yeah, as you can tell, it's pretty much grown over. It is an extremely attractive species with finely divided leaves that are somewhat fern-like. And although this one is grown in sort of medium uh, brightness of light, in lower light it can have a bluish metallic sheen to the leaves. There's a little bit of that visible in some of the leaves here, that bluish metallic, but it definitely gets it a lot more in lower light. This is a very prolific species of begonia. It tends to reproduce quite quickly and quite easily. There's just baby plants popping up all over this little piece of broken leaf that fell off. And it's not even touching any substrate either. It's just kind of hanging there off the plant in the humid air. Down in the corner here underneath the begonia is a species of Selaginella. It is a dark maroonish brown coloration. 
and it has a compact growth habit and it stays relatively low. This is a bin with some immersed plants in it. In part one of the tour, I showed the same plant. This is another of the Cryptocorni parva microform. One of my favorite plants, but really, really slow growing, unfortunately. This is a cultivar of Anubius barteri var nana, known as pangolino. This was developed by a plant breeder who was growing another cultivar of Bartari Varnana, which I believe was called Bonsai or something like that. In any case, they found one that had a mutation that gave it this leaf form, and so they broke it out and started uh, propagating that one. So we now have the Pangolino. It does stay this small. Unfortunately, it's very, very slow growing. One of the things I like about growing immersed plants in a really wet environment is the ability to get a lot of uh, liverworts and moss and stuff like this ricardia. It's a uh, really beautiful little micro liverwort ricardia species and they just thrive in these very wet humid environments. So in immersed conditions you know with cryptocorony and hydrocotyl and stuff like that you can really grow these carpets. Here's a pot with more ricardia, some hydrocotyl and this crypt right here is cryptocorony bichettii. It can get pretty large, but in bright light, it seems to stay relatively compact. It has a very dark brownish foliage, almost with some maroon or kind of orange underneath. These are a fun marsh plant. This is Areocaulon cynerian. Uh, it is often grown in aquariums, but you can grow it immersed. It has grass-like foliage, and then it has these cool flower spikes that come up that have these little uh, ball-like flowers at the end. This one actually came from seed. I had an adult, you know, mother plant that died back, but it had bloomed and the seeds fell down, and then this grew from seed. This pot has a Cryptocorony UGI, which is a species that can get relatively large, has attractive leaf shape and color. Uh, it has stayed somewhat compact in here probably because it's in sort of bright light compared to what it would grow in its natural environment. It also hasn't been as happy. It, it was looking really good a while back, but it's starting to die back, although some new leaves are coming up like this one right here. Quickly, I'll comment on how I'm growing stuff in this bin. Basically, I have a ventilation screen on the side here and you can learn how I install these and how I set this up in my grow bin tutorial series and then I just have some water in the bottom of the bin and then I take all the plants and plant them in their desired substrate in pots. I've got some mesh inside and this is like a plant aquatic plant basket. Anyway I just use whatever substrate mostly fluval stratum sometimes gravel sometimes some other uh, mixes and then you just set those pots down in the water there and then it gets nice and wet and humid and all these immersed plants like cryptocorny just love it. Here's another immersed setup bin just like the other one I've got the pots with the mesh and then the substrate and then they're just set down in the water in the bottom of the bin there. This is a Bucephalandra species and in the hobby they call it Skeleton King or Achilles. The species is Bucephalandra kishii and this one has been blooming. You can see the spathe here. It has a multiple growth points, kind of in a clump here, so it's been spreading. Here's a little Cryptocorony aura, which is an extremely difficult to grow species of crypt. I haven't really done that well with it. It keeps dying back and then coming back again. I don't really have a lot of time to individually spend with different plants. I just kind of do the best I can. Got a variety of different plants in here. Here's a little floating plant called Pistia stratiotes, or people call it water lettuce. It's a rosette forming floating one from the family Aracea, and it has pubescent leaves on it. Right here have Hydrocotyl verticillata, which is another one that people grow in aquariums a lot. Believe it or not, despite how common this is and how simple of a plant it is, this Hydrocotyl verticillata is actually one of my favorite plants of all time. I don't know exactly why, but I mean, I guess the question is really why do we like anything? And the answer is we just do. Love that plant. Down here, there's another Cryptocorny aura. There's a little one down there coming back. That's nice. Over here, got the Pagostamin helferi. Um, people in the aquarium hobby sometimes call it downoy. I'm not sure exactly why. Flip the bin around over in the corner. 
here have a bunch of floating plants, a bunch of Salvinia minima, and Salvinia is, believe it or not, a fern. It's a floating species of fern. It is a true fern, and it has little pinna that are rounded and have microscopic hooks on them. Very interesting plant. This is a smaller species within the genus. And this is Amazon frogbit or Limnobium levigatum, which is a plant that sort of looks like a little miniature water lily. That's a neat one. Something special I want to point out about this bin is that I have a little tiny miniature water pump in it. It's just a really small, no name brand pump. I decided to do an experiment with that. I wanted to see what would happen if I put a little pump in there and circulated the water in the bin. Uh, it was particularly for the Cryptocorni aura because they grow in flowing water in streams and things like that. So I thought maybe the water flowing through the mesh basket uh, and circulating would help the plant grow. I have noticed a definite market uh, improvement in growth of the floating plants and a bunch of the other plants with the water pump in it. It seems to really make a difference and keep the water a lot uh, cleaner and like not getting as stagnant and the plants seem to appreciate the, the movement of the water through the roots. So I feel like that experiment was very enlightening. This awesome little plant here that looks like a vine this is in the family Ericaceae, and it is an epiphytic shrub. So it hangs down from trees and rocks and so forth in its native habitat, which is most likely Central or South America. It gets little flowers, and it can produce berries. So I'm calling it either Dysterygma af agasmoides, or potentially Dysterygma af micranthum. As I've mentioned before regarding the fern species Elephoglossum peltatum, there are many, many forms. So it's within the same species, there's a whole bunch of uh, different shapes and sizes of that plant with different frond shapes. So this one is a little bisected frond mini form. So it's very small compared to most other Elephoglossum peltatum forms, and it has a really unique frond that's kind of divided into two little pieces and they have uh, kind of ribs to each pinna so that is probably one of my favorite Elephoglossum peltatum forms right here we've got a peperomia that has reddish stems and it has dark green leaves that almost seem to have a purplish undertone to them so it almost has like a purple leaf to it it's kind of a grayish green with purple and it has stunning silver veins throughout that purple foliage and it's just a neat little trailing plant. The other notable thing in this bin is a fern. This is an Asplenium species right here and there's two types of fronds right now. There's this frond right here that is the regular sterile frond and it's pretty small and then there's the fertile frond, which is the spore bearing one. And I just think this is the coolest looking thing here. You know, it has the regular pinna, and then it gets this really long, weird pinna that just goes all the way down at the end. That, that part on the end is almost as long as the entire rest of the frond. So it's like half of the whole length. It's really, really cool. And right now, as I said, it's fertile, so it is bearing sori underneath which produce the spore. You know I have to go straight to the fern in this bin first. This is without a doubt one of my favorite ferns of all time. It's, there's just so many things to talk about with this fern. I mean first of all just look at how finely divided and intricate it is and just how stunning that frond is. I mean it's incredible. Second of all it has the coloration. It's very kind of grayish green so it has uh, almost a glaucous coating to it. Some of it has like a silver coating over it and can in lower light have kind of a whitish or bluish uh, coloration. Then there's a very unique growth form how the frond comes out and it just grows very 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 long and just sort of snakes around and then at that tip on the tip of the frond it has a little bulb and it grows a new plant. So you can see a baby plant here, there's a baby plant here, there's a baby plant here, right on the tip of the frond. This begonia over here that's taken up half of the bin is kind of a weedy, fast-growing species. 
It is Begonia Prismaticarpa. It is a miniature little guy from Africa and it's very prolific in terms of blooming. It pretty much blooms all the time, like almost year round. And it has yellow flowers with orange and red on the, you know, flushing the inside of the petal there. Um, really pretty flowers, really cool little miniature plant. And another couple things about it that's a bonus is number one, it's very easy to grow. And so I recommend it for beginners. And number two, it doesn't mind being really wet. So like if you overwater it or you want to plant it in a wet area, it will do just fine. In fact, it seems to much prefer being wet over just being moist or dry. Uh, so, and it looks better in lower light. This one's in a little bit bright light, but it definitely looks better in lower light. Let's take a 30 second break so I can tell you about a new resource I created to help you learn what products and supplies I use for terrariums and plants. The Another World Terraria Amazon page has my favorite items organized by categories such as substrates, lighting, tools, and so on, as well as by specific goals such as creating a grow bin, growing Boosie Immersed, and culturing microfauna. In combination with the free video tutorials on my channel, the Amazon shopping lists will set you up for success with rare plants and terrarium projects. Check it out at amazon.com slash shop slash another world terraria these two ferns right here are the fern that in the aquarium hobby has been called borneo fern or sometimes identified as trichomanes javonicum the correct id is cephalomanes javonicum it is a filmy fern in the family hymenophilacea this plant was often sold as an aquarium plant in the past and it still is sometimes sold as an aquarium plant, but it is not a true aquatic species. It may grow underwater for a period of time, but in nature it is more of what is called a facultative rheophyte, which means that if there's a flash flood or something like that, it will be able to survive underwater for a period of time, but it does not generally grow underwater permanently, so it's not a true aquatic plant. This one right here is definitely a lot happier than the other one. This one's put out a lot of new foliage. Uh, some of the fronds that are on here that don't look as good are old fronds that the plant came in with, and then all the ones that look nicer like these are the new ones that have grown. Also, I didn't miss it as much as I should, uh, as well as I think I removed the shade cloth by accident, and so it was in too bright of light as well. They really like to be in dim light and they need pretty much like 100% humidity in order to do well. The substrate that I'm using is a mix of sand, gravel, shredded sphagnum, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, fluval stratum, pumice. I just kind of mixed a bunch of stuff together and brought it up to the base of the plant and then gave it a very long time and then it eventually adapted and started growing. As far as the other stuff in here, there's just a whole bunch of different filmy ferns. There's one of my favorite ones in the corner there. There's some really unique ones with long, thin fronds with undulate margins. There's some little tiny micro ones in here that's hard, hard to get a close-up of. And there's some very nice liverworts down there. All kinds of stuff. For certain plants, I use this fiberglass window screen to shade the plants, but the uh, Cephalomani Javonicum, believe it or not, this is what I use. This is a black piece of plastic, completely opaque, so literally the only light coming through is whatever comes through here and then also from the other lights on the side of this bin. So it's very, very dim underneath here. Going back to some bins with immersed plants, just completely full of Liliopsis brasiliensis, which is the one that's kind of like a grass all through here. It's a really uh, neat little miniature plant that is often grown in aquariums and it's doing well in here. And in fact, it is blooming. It has a whole bunch of hundreds of of tiny tiny little flowers like little white flowers they're very beautiful but they're just really small and hard to see all along the side with little tiny round leaves that's flat like a ground cover that's micranthemum umbrosum which is another plant people grow in aquariums over here is a species of hygrophila it's a stem plant that people use in aquariums it's known as araguaya obviously very thin lanceolate foliage and a reddish pinkish coloration and it does get 
uh, purple flowers. So very, very pretty plant for Wabi Kusa and th things like that. Another immersed bin with a bunch of stuff. Some of the stuff not doing as good. I need to trim some things and clean a little bit of mold out and stuff like that. Some of the stuff kind of yellowing, so it probably needs some fur. I think this one dried out a few months ago, and so things are starting to come back now. I think that's why some of the stuff doesn't look good. Some of the things died when it dried out. Got some more Micranthemum umbrosum. I just think that's a really nice ground cover plant great for very wet areas in vivariums and for wabicusa and all that good stuff and some different species of ludwigia here got some juncus repens which is a grass-like plant that's very nice also for wabicusa there's a little plant right here with very stunning bright bright pink almost fluorescent pink foliage and i don't know what that is I think it might be a species of Rotala, but that one has stayed very small. It doesn't seem to do as well immersed. I'm sure it does much better submersed. This right here is a Ludwigia, but I don't I don't recall the species, but that's a nice Ludwigia with needle-like foliage. All right, we're getting into some carnivorous plants now, or to the initiated CPs. This right here is Drosera adelaide. These are baby plants. This species will get much larger than this. Uh, Drosera are known as sundews as a common name and they have trichomes all over the leaves that get sticky globules on the end and insects and so forth get stuck to that and then the plant digests them and uses it for nutrients. Here's a species of Utricularia which are known as bladderworts because they have little tiny bladder type traps in their root system that goes in the water and little microscopic crustaceans and so forth go in there and they get sucked into the bladder and then it digests them. This I believe is Utricularia reniformis or there's a number of ones that have similar reniform shaped leaves, reniform meaning shaped like a kidney. I know there's a much larger species that has similar shaped leaves but this one stays small. Here's a Utricularia as well. I do not know what the ID is on this one and I don't recall what the flower looked like so for now it's just Utricularia species. This is Utricularia libida and it is getting ready to bloom. I do want to mention about Utricularia that they're extremely invasive. You can see how aggressive this baby is spreading all underneath the substrate and uh, you can't really see it but there's some traps in here, the little bladders. Um, so if you ever want to use it in a terrarium, just be aware it's pretty much going to grow everywhere and just take over everything. Another Utricularia, this is a very, very tiny species with minuscule leaves that are hard to see. There's a few leaves mixed in with the moss and liverworts in here, just kind of around the edge and some in the middle. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but that's Utricularia warburgii. This is one of my favorite Utricularia species. It's U pubescens, and it has orbiculate peltate leaves which means that the leaves are round and have the stem attaching underneath in the center. Here's a very special carnivorous plant. This is Pinguicula gigantea. So this one gets very very large. Gets like the size of a dinner plate. Just massive huge leaves. In this deli container here I have a bunch of moss and various stuff mixed in there but right in the middle is a cluster of Aerocaulon species Vietnam. It is a grass-like plant that can be grown in an aquarium submersed or it can be grown immersed because it grows in wet kind of you know marshland areas or whatever. It bloomed self-fertilized germinated seeds and the uh, baby plants are actually growing on the end of the flower spike. Here's a very unique and attractive Margravia species which is a vining climbing plant. Uh, the leaves are very oblong and kind of narrow and long, which is cool. And it has a beautiful coloration on the foliage of, you know, uh, pink and peach colors and so forth towards the end. And then as the foliage gets older, it starts to get darker green, as you can see back here. Um, very attractive species. One thing I want to point out about Markgravia as well as a number of other vining climbing species and shinglers and so forth in the hobby, oftentimes what you're seeing is immature young foliage 
and the plant in the wild when it climbs up really big and matures and gets larger will often throw out foliage and stems that look completely different from what you're seeing uh, in a vivarium. Oftentimes in a vivarium they just don't have the uh, time or the space or the conditions or what have you to uh, mature and put out that foliage. The young foliage like you see here these are called bathophils. Um, that means that it's the immature um, foliage and then the mature stems and leaves that it will grow that looks different are called acrophils. Here's a deli container with an attractive clump of Cryptocorni parva. It's mixed in with a bunch of moss, but the Cryptocorni parva is in there looking really healthy and happy. Speaking of Cryptocorni parva, contrast this plant with the tiny microform that I showed earlier in the tour that is only about a half inch tall. This one gets about, you know, a couple inches tall. This plant is a little cutting of a plant that I showed in the video part one of the tour, which is in the family Melastomataceae. It is a vining plant. It is from Peru, unidentified, and it has a very attractive glossy foliage with pubescence all over it. Um, it can get much larger than this, so if allowed to grow and mature, it will get much larger leaves have a couple specimens of Begonia lichenora, which is one of my all-time favorite plants. It's a very miniature species of Begonia. You can see how attractive the foliage is, and in this case, it is growing in an overlapping fashion. It has sort of a pinkish maroon tinge around the outside. It can have a bluish metallic sheen to it in low light. This is exhibiting a little bit of that bluish sheen but in much lower light, the whole plant can uh, be much more prominent with that. And then it also has some uh, little tiny white flowers. Here's the other begonia like Nora in the deli container. I'm experimenting with some different substrates. Number one, it's extremely rare in the USA at least right now. Uh, not that many people have it. The other thing about it is it's very, very uh, touchy and a little bit tricky to grow. It also takes forever to establish itself from a cutting. A lot of times we'll drop leaves and just look like it's not doing well. You'll think it's gonna die. And then sometimes when it has like one leaf left, you'll get lucky and it'll come back and then it'll just blow up and you know, it'll start growing and looking really good. But they are prone to melt um, for no apparent reason. So it's a little bit tricky species and quite rare, but definitely one of my favorites and worth the trouble. I know I say this a lot, but this is one of my favorite plants. A lot of people might look at this and think, oh yeah, that's the oak leaf ficus, but it is in fact not that plant. This is something totally unidentified. This could potentially be in the family Hydrangeaceae, which is the family that has hydrangeas, which is stuff that a lot of people have in their garden that become giant shrubs.